Hi, my name is Douglas Vogt from the Die Hole Foundation. We're a 501c3 science foundation. Its purpose is to find the causes of the ice age in polar reversals. And this is video series four, uh, and the first in the series. I think there'll be a total of five videos in this one series. This is intended to give you the education that you didn't get, that you should have gotten. Uh, the first thing is, I'm going to be explaining why or how I found the clock cycle, which is kind of a repeat of some of the earlier videos. Uh, but it also explains why the Ice Age happens immediately after a geomagnetic or polar reversal. Now, I want to make sure people understand when I say a polar reversal, the Earth does not flip upside down, <laughs> where physically the North Pole and South Pole flip upside down. It's the magnetic field reverses and something else happens at that time also. Uh, I'm going to explain the mechanism. You're going to see uh, why the ice fields are formed or how, what, what forms them. And basically, you get an idea of why they hid it from you. Uh, the video will also reveal the greatest secret the country has. There's no greater secret than this. The secret starts and goes back to 1958 uh, during uh, Sunspot Maximum 19, and you'll find out why. I'm going to give you the education you should have gotten in college or universities. If you're an astronomer, astrophysicist, geologist, geophysicist, or one of the other hard sciences, uh, you're going to find out why you were not told the truth or you were given an alternate explanation for some very common phenomena or observations in both on the Earth as well as in, in space. Now this is really important. It's going to make you mad when you find out why they did it and who, who did it and how they engineered this. Um, anyway, that's, that's part of it. The audience for this video is going to be anyone over 21 years old. You've got to be mature, have to have a brain in your head, and some of it is scary. It will frighten a lot of people. When they read my book, God's Your Judgment, they all said this is the scariest book they ever read in their life because they couldn't see an alternate explanation. What I'm going to be covering is covered almost entirely in Chapter 8 of this book. It has over 400 references from the journal Science, Nature, and other journals. So, but it's important. It literally means whether you have a future because this event is going to happen within the lifetime of most of you. Anyway, let me continue. We're going to start out with the clock cycle. The clock cycle is the thing that causes uh, the reversal and what happens on the sun that gives us the ice age. Uh, how I found it was simply a database of all known stars, open clusters, and globular clusters. It's listed in chapter 8 of, of the book and, and chapter 3. Uh, and I found six blank periods in space, which there shouldn't have been any blank periods. Uh, the stars are there, and you had to figure out why you couldn't see them. The end result was I found four of the six were basically 12,068 light years apart. And for about 977 light years, a little bit more, uh, there was no stars visible, but the stars are there. The reason why you don't see them, you're going to see next, is that they were concealed by the nova that threw out the dust shell around the star that concealed most of the average size stars, like the one the size of our, our own sun. The very large ones were so big and powerful, it blew it way out and you had no problem seeing it. And you'll see some examples of those. But this is the clock cycle. This is really what it represents. Um, let's say this is our galaxy, which it really isn't. Here's the, our solar system. And every 12,068 light years, you're basically going back in time. So each one of these, there was a blank period, no stars visible. I found the number 12,068 in our solar cycle. I'll get over here. What this is, is the Gleisberg cycle. It was discovered by uh, Gleisberg. And what he noticed was there was a series of eight sunspot cycles. You know, the 1880s goes 
all the way up to 1957-58. That was the last Gleisberg cycle. And then it starts down, but the, it's supposed to drop down to a low level, and it doesn't. He was the first in the series, and he is the first in that series, much higher than the other. This is where it comes down to. A solar cycle is 11.09 years. Eight of them is 88.73 years. 136 Gleisberg cycles is 12,068 years. I'll explain what you're looking at. Every computer scientist right now knows exactly what I just showed. This is a resynchronizing frequency. This is a synchronizing frequency, all geared to the main clock cycle. Remember what I have in video series one on the theory of multidimensional reality. I go through some of the same stuff, but I prove it how the universe is really created. We're in a synchronous system. That proves it. That's irrefutable. I, I prove it also in the carbon-14 dating of the ice ages and stuff like that. Same 12,000 year cycle. Okay, to figure out a great secret, you have to find the starting point. What event in time caused a other group of people or a nation to react to it to do something? This is what happened. This is the last Gleisberg cycle. This is what the sun looked like. I think it was on the 24th. 24th, it had 355 sunspots in one day. You can see in here, uh, it was all over 316 for about five days, six days. It really blew its brains out. It went wild. And it scared the science community. I remember one of the journal articles was, is our model of the sun correct? It ain't, and they know it. This is some photographs done by uh, two German institutions. They did a much better job of mapping the sunspots than the, United St the U.S. Uh, colleges did. And, in fact, this guy, this one, recorded 420 or 25 sunspots in one day. A lot more than 355. That's a lot. So, this is what the sun looked like. Here's another way of measuring solar output. And it answers one of the questions regarding global warming. Here again, the red is, is the Gleisberg cycle, and here's our... 19, by the way, that, that happened in 1957, December 1957. And it dropped down again. Now the blue line is sea surface temperature. And you see since this date, the last Gleisberg cycle, it has been steadily going up. Now they're only saying it's, I think it's one and a half to two degrees Fahrenheit goes up. But the point is you can see everything is going up since then. Another important date, February 10th and 11th, the sun must have gone nuts and, and sent off a, a shell probably four or five days before that, those two dates. And what it did was produce an aurora borealis that was seen from approximately 40 degrees latitude north. The Europeans saw one. I think this one is either Europe or Alaska, and this one was Europe. It's one or the other. And I remember it. I was living in, in New York, uh, out in the island, and I remember it as a kid. My friend who was living in eastern Washington, uh, Larry, he remembers it. And maybe many of you who are roughly the same age is going to remember what this thing looked like. The sun really went nuts. That scared the Europeans, it scared us, and it scared people in government. They knew they had to do something. They had to investigate it. So I'm going to show you how they, they wound up responding. By the way, I had another one. Aurora Borealis was also uh, um, seen November 13, 1960, and October 1, 61. This is all the solar cycle 19 as it was going down. But the sun really erupted badly. Here's an example. This is the sun, I think, under ultraviolet light. And here's give you an idea what it looks like when they erupt. And this is the size of the Earth, pretty small. Uh, so we're dealing with something that's really produces our heat, our light, and is dangerous. <laughs> okay, so this is, how did the government react to what you just saw? The event that set it all off. 
International Geophysical Year. It started in um, June or July of 1957 and went through December 31st, 1958. This stamp was issued May 31st, 1958. Now remember what happened February 11th and 10th of 58. <clears throat> These are engraved, I have this poster stamp. These are engraved stamps, and it takes like two to three weeks to make the engraving and put the plates. It must have taken about uh, two or three weeks to come up with the design, get it approved. Then they had to print it and distribute it to all the post offices. So they must have had this thing in the works since February of 58, and delivered it and released it by May 31st. So what's funny about this, three things, one, International Geophysical Year. Geophysical means the study of the Earth. Now, why do they have a semicircle of the sun erupting? Maybe they're trying to tell you something. But what they're really trying to tell you is, gee, something of a geophysical year, and why do we have two hands up here? I wonder where they got those two hands. Oh, yeah, Michelangelo, the ceiling of the 16th chapel. This is supposedly God. And this is Dear Sweet Adam, minus some clothing. And perhaps what they're basically saying with the postage stamp is that, please God, help us figure out what's about to happen to us, and hopefully we're not going to be all killed from it. Now, if you read my video series one, my explanation of how the universe really works, I've just shown you it's, we're in a synchronous system. Well, all synchronous systems have an operating system. All computers have an operating system. Now you know who God is, the God of this die hold, which is what they call the synchronous system. The die hold uh, has an operating system. That's it. So that's my definition of God is the one who's the operating system who runs this die hold and the one that creates our reality, whole universe. That's explained not only in video series one, but also video series, I think it's two on the Hebrew alphabet, the last of that series explains the whole thing, basically the secret of the universe. I want to make another comment, too. We always show that Adam is a man. Well, like I said, the operating system is not male or female. It's both. It has the information for both. So in the beginning of, the, of Genesis, it winds up saying uh, that God created man in his image. So he doesn't, he's not male or female. He has information of both. What he created was a hermaphrodite. To prove the point, a few verses later, it says, oh, Adam's going to be so lonesome, and we've got to make a, a mate for him, because all the animals have mates. So he goes into a deep sleep, pulls something out of what he labels as Adam, this hermaphrodite, and creates something else. What I think he really created was Adam. If my, my knowledge of anatomy is correct, the female anatomy is much more complicated than the male one. So chances are he pulled a male out of the female, and, and he had a male and female. So that's just an aside. I, I wanted to add it because I didn't know where to put it, but it's a, it's a good point. Here's the other way, the way they uh, responded to what was going to happen. This is the, the date that they created NASA. And it was passed July 29th, 1958. Now, remember it happened in February. So there's 90 days that goes through the, uh, the legislative process, probably a month to write this thing, and committees, you know what government works, slows molasses. They must have worked a little faster. This thing got passed July 29th, 58. Eisenhower signed it into law. This is what created NASA. And now you know why they created NASA. Uh, I want to ask also, the same time is when the Russians put up Sputnik, and we were studying the uh, Van Allen belts and everything like that. It's all about the sun. OK, now basic stuff. This is also does not show up in any geology or geography books or meteorological books on the ice age and how it formed. What they give you is just flat out lies. What they generally teach you is somehow, magically, either there was too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and it got colder by 5 degrees, and we got an instant ice age. I lived in Seattle, Washington, for about 38 years, in Bellevue, Washington. And digging in my backyard, 
Um, I had glacial till that was resembled more like asphalt. Supposedly, we had an ice field there of 4,000 feet thick. They're probably right. 4,000 feet thick of ice is, a, I think, at 105 tons per square foot, and that probably created asphalt. Anyway, some of the journals I've read, I have, I'll have, you'll see references along here. Uh, I put them down here in case you doubt me. Go check them out. Uh, one with the study of uh, the Great Lakes, Northern Great Lakes, they figured it, the snow was deposited within 40 years, another one was 100 years. This one was said 100 years. So, in order to get an ice field, you first have to have snow. You gotta somehow deposit the snow on the ground to give you the ice field of entry. So, uh, no place could I find a ratio between how much snow gives you a foot of glacial ice. There's a big variation on the weight of snow. I saw everything from 50 kilograms up to 300 for a cubic meter of snow, and 850 to 900 and something for glacial ice. So I took an average of it, and it comes out to a 4.86 to 1 ratio. And there was 4.86 feet of snow gives you one foot of glacial ice. So if I had an ice field in Seattle, which I really do believe we did, of 4,000 feet, that translates to 19,400 feet of snow, just based on weight. This is not a normal snowfall, folks. Anyone tells you, oh yeah, it went down five degrees, oh, it's so horrible, and we got an ice age automatically. That person is so dumb and stupid, they should never be in front of a classroom. So, what I've shown you here, the reason why this is all blacked out, this is called whiteout conditions where you can barely see the nose in front of your face. That's what you're going to wind up getting. Now, to get snow, you've got to have clouds. This is my clouds here in Florida. We've got beautiful clouds here in Florida. <coughs> got to have clouds. To have clouds, you have to have evaporation. I like this picture. I actually see the, the sun heating up and you see the moisture rising up. And it gets to a certain altitude where it gets cold enough and the water vapor condenses, you got clouds. So the key to the whole thing, if you have an ice field that's 4,000 feet thick on one side of the equation, you have to have an equal amount of heat on the other side of the equation to give you that ice field. That's irrefutable. Now, how come they never mention any of this? This is one of the things they've done a wonderful job of keeping you dumb and stupid. Okay, so I had to figure it out. This is what it comes down to. Uh, just after the reversal slash nova, the nova is the only thing that gives you the, the energy, you're about to see it. The ocean level is down at least 400 feet for probably the first 100 years. And then for, uh, from then on, for about 300 years after that, it was about 350 feet down. Worldwide, the ocean levels were that far down worldwide. Now, when the sun first novas, the sun side of the Earth, whatever oceans there, probably went down by 1,000 feet, and that equalized from the... Okay, so this is what it comes down to. One gallon is equal to 3,782 grams. One cubic foot of water is 28.3 liters. 28.3 liters equal 28,300 grams. To evaporate one gram of water, this is distilled water, H2O only from 50 degrees or 10 degrees centigrade up to the boiling point takes a 619 calories. Now remember, the ocean salt water takes more calories, but this is what the chemistry books have. To evaporate one cubic foot of water is 17,500,000 calories. That's a lot. A column of water, 350 cubic feet of water, takes, there it is, 6.131 billion calories of heat. Now, that's not totally accurate. You see, you need another 80 grams to go from boiling water to evaporation. So it comes out to about 6.8 billion calories. Uh, what's the only heat source remotely close to the Earth that could produce that kind of heat? You're going to see later, it does it real fast. One day, the sun. 
now you understand, I hope a light bulb has gone off in somebody's head, what they're concealing. This is our wonderful son. I think this was 1980-something or other. It, it interrupted a little bit. Didn't look too pretty. This is a solar flare. Now, when the star novas, they all seem to nova a little differently. You'll, you'll see some pictures in a few minutes. This is the Cooper belt or Kuiper belt, K-U-I-P-E-R belt, pronounce it any way you want. And this is really, the explanation they give you here, which of course is wrong, is that they say it's the primordial dust and gases that form the sun and the, and the solar system. Totally wrong. This is how far out that novas horizontally through the, the planetary plane and finally its velocity meets an equilibrium between gravity and acceleration and it stops around here. This is past the, the, um, uh, the Uranus, uh, the planet Uranus. And I think they also see some of them past, uh, past um, Saturn also and Neptune. It's, it's there. That's as far as it goes. That's what's out there. Okay, now we're going to get into the, the cover-up. This is where all of you PhDs in astronomy, astrophysics, geophysics, etc. are going to get mad. Hopefully not at me, but you're going to get mad. And you should. <clears throat> National Security Act of 47 was passed in, in July 26th. And it created the various divisions in the the Department of Army, before it was all called the War Department. They split it up to Air Force, Army, Navy, and this is also where they created the CIA. Here's the law. This is the updated law as of January of 2018. And it's under Section 104A. And I'm going to read you Part 1 and 3. To collect intelligence for human resources, blah, 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 agencies shall have no police for subpoena or law enforcement powers or internal security functions. I know personally they're, they're violating that. Three, provide overall, overall direction for and coordination of the collection of national intelligence outside the United States through human resources by elements of the intelligence community, blah, blah, blah. They're only allowed to gather information outside the United States not function internally at all. <clears throat> this has two stories to it. This is my first book, Reality Revealed. It was copyright 1977. I did some radio shows, latter part of 77 and beginning of 78. And uh, I explained um, at that time how the, uh, that the sun nova, that's the thing that causes the ice age, and that part of the mechanism. I hadn't figured out and discovered the 12,068 period yet, the blank periods in space. They didn't discover that until 1989, I think it was. Anyway, uh, I got a weird call from, of all places, Fort Lewis, just south of Tacoma, Washington. And they wanted to, I'm not kidding here, they wanted me to investigate a ghost they had in the attic of the military museum by I-5. No way I was gonna go down there. This is just too stupid for words. So I just told them what to do, spectrum analyzers and stuff like that to go find anything. So I didn't bite. Within two weeks, I got a call from a guy from, he said, from Tacoma. And he was talking about the book. And he wanted to know how I figured it out. I said I did a lot of reading and a lot of research. And later he did say he was a retired CIA agent. Retired my foot. Anyway, that was my first contact with the Central Intelligence Agency, wanting to find out how I figured it out. Second story. I was on Laura Lee's radio show in 19... Um, 93, November, and it was broadcast. You had some affiliates in Maryland and near Washington, D.C. And uh, originally the book was Index uh, Parapsychology, 
there's only one chapter in it, chapter seven on it. It's kind of an insult. And so I went to, I was in Washington, D.C. in April 16th, 1994. And I went to the Library of Congress finding out why they indexed it that way. And she looked it up, she printed out the print, printout she had, and she said that one of the intelligence agencies reclassified my book Q175, which is philosophy of science. And I didn't ask him to do that. But I know why. Certain Library of Congress indexes, they index all those subjects and books, and they put it in a real big database. They want to know who's writing what. Anyway, that was my other experience. And I found out later it was the CIA that wound up indexing it. Don't think too many people ever had that for an honor. Okay, I get a letter May 9th, 1979 from a guy named Ken Kuzman in Federal Way, Washington. He had read my book. Now, I kind of, he had more in here. I just took Photoshop, and I took the first paragraph here, and I just brought the footnote in, which is the important part. But uh, anyway, he, he read the book. He agreed with it for various reasons, his own research. The footnote's the important part. In reference to the latter part of your book, I have a cousin who is an astrophysicist and professor at the University of Alaska. In 1973, he told me over a drink of an impending disaster that takes place every 12 to 15,000 years. In other words, the reversal isn't every 300,000 or 600,000 years. He said many scientists are aware of this and that the covert reason for the space program was to explore the effects of the disaster throughout the solar system, i.e. moon landings, planetary probes, etc. Um, that's why they created NASA. Now I know that for a fact because when I read so many journals after I, read, after I wrote the first book, uh, I could see them writing between the lines and some of them flat out saying it. <clears throat> this is the also important part for the CIA. He also said, we do not have the technology nor the foreseeable technology to avoid this inevitable situation. Inevitable situation. All we can hope to do is gather information. The assumption they made is wrong. You can save your rear ends about this, but you'll understand why they're never going to figure it out. Okay, first term, Ronald Reagan takes office, great president, I voted for him, even as governor. <clears throat> his, his first and only um, uh, director of the CIA was William Casey. And at the meeting, uh, President Reagan asked Casey what is his function uh, as director of the CIA. And this is his direct quote. It's not a joke. We will know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American public believes is false. This is not a joke. All you professors, I want this to ring in your ears and you're going to understand why. This is the lady who took it down. She was the assistant to chief domestic policy advisor to President Reagan. There she is. Her name is Barbara Honiger. She responded to people who said, first they thought that quote was wrong. She said no, she was in the meeting, she took the dictation, and then she told it to senior White House correspondent Sarah McClendon, who made it public. It's not a joke. So you have to ask, okay, why are they making this information? Why should we know everything that, that's wrong? And it's all to lead back to the causes of the Ice Age and what happens. Now again, another one of my experiences, personal experiences, firsthand. I own a typesetting company from 1979 to 89, I think it was. And I did math books and journals and regular books. Read a lot. One of the journals I did, I think it was the only one they had at the time, was optical engineering. And this was cutting edge technology, um, optical imaging, optical recognition, holographic mass memory. In the middle 80s they had 300 billion bits per square centimeter, retrieval times of 300 million bits per second. That was in the mid-1980s. 
Anyway, um, what was funny about this journal, the, the uh, director of production, her name was Mrs. Cherry, a nice sweet old lady, and she would either mail me the manuscripts or I'd pick them up in Bellingham. I have to drive 100 miles to pick it up in Bellingham, drive back and do them, and I mail them back. Now, when I was getting these things, I, they had a watermark. I put them up, the watermark on the manuscripts up in the light, and what did I see? The American Eagle with one, two, and three stars above the eagle's head. Anybody who's been in the military know exactly what that is. So I knew where this stuff was coming from. Well, I, I asked her, I asked her also, you know, some of this stuff could be top secret. It's really cutting edge technology. And she said, that's oh, okay. We have a committee here at SPIE that goes through the papers and decides what's, what's top secret or secret or what can be published. Now, anybody who's ever gotten a security clearance damn well knows there's something wrong from that statement. A private entity, like a publisher, does not have the legal right to index or classify anything secret or top secret. Only the federal government does. The Defense Department, the White House, FBI, CIA, NSA, maybe the Justice Department, if they can find any justice there. So what's, a, what's a, book, a, a magazine publisher doing with the right to decide what gets classified top secret and not? How come they're getting manuscripts with, with, with the American Eagle as a watermark on it? So I knew, I knew what I was dealing with right off the bat. Also, they occupied a formerly a, a nun's convent in Bellingham, a gorgeous building that a publisher could never afford even one floor. They had the whole building. Okay, since then, they publish astronomical telescope instruments and systems. Think of remote sensing, like to be able to read a license plate from 5,000 feet up, 5,000 miles up rather. Uh, electronic imaging, image recognition, nanophotonics, God knows what that is, uh, photonics and, uh, for energy, and of course optical engineering. All these have military applications. Now we get to the good stuff. You'll understand what's happening. I may be running out of time because I have to go someplace, but um, I'll continue. Uh, this was written in July, uh, um, July 1946. The CIA was created in July of 1947. So this is a year before the CIA was created. So when you see his director of central intelligence, in the Defense Department was called Central Intelligence Group. Now, the Central Intelligence Group, which is this, got morphed into the CIA because approved for release 2002, May, CIA record. This was in the CIA record. So all the Central Intelligence Groups was morphed and moved over to the CIA. That's the sequence of events, what happened. Now, at the same time, there was a bill in Congress, H.R. 6448, you have to excuse the bad type here. This was basically a, a microfilm, uh, a, a scan of a microfilm, and it showed how bad the typewriter was. So forgive me, it's their problem. So they were going to create the National Science Foundation. Is a bell going off in some of the professors' heads right now? Yeah. Let me, I'll probably have explained that right now. You see, uh, the colleges and universities, uh, even the hard sciences, they have to come up with two missing months of salary. So they have to apply for grant money, and the way they do it, where they go, is the National Science Foundation. But it hadn't been created yet. This bill didn't really get passed until May of 1950. So, going to be an independent, independent government agency. Uh, HR blah, 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 has full endorsement of the Office of Scientific Research and Development. Uh, which would be absorbed by the foundation under the terms of the bill. So in other words, parts of the Defense Department was going to get morphed into the National Science Foundation. That's how they get some of the control. The proposal of National Science Foundation will provide a focal center whereby CIG, Central Intelligence Group, 
can have access to scientific research activities, it goes on, provide a, a means for presenting requests to private organizations to undertake research in scientific fields, including social science, social sciences. They want to figure out how to brainwash people. They've done a wonderful job. Unfortunately, CIG would want to maintain close liaison with the foundation. Yeah, they're in it. <clears throat> Proposed foundation is to provide for the support of American scientific research and development by grants of financial grants and contracts to and correlated uh, correlate scientific research and development programs uh, undertaken by public and private research groups, your colleges and universities. Got it. To foster national and international exchange of scientific information. This is the important one. Develop and promote a national policy for scientific research and scientific education. Remember the line, he who pays the piper plays the tune. They control the purse springs and they approve any scientific research you want to do. They effectively control what gets published. So if you hit, like Thomas Gohl and a few others, at the Sun Does Nova, you're not getting the grant money. Uh, goes on. National Defense. Uh, the National Defense Division is to have up to 40 committee members. In that earlier bill, it said how many, there was a scientific structure for the thing, uh, how many board members were from each group. I don't know if it existed when the bill finally got passed, almost three years later. Uh, this is the funny part. At least 15% of the appropriated funds must be spent on research and development related to the national defense. In other words, it's probably way more than 15, but probably 50, 60 percent. In other words, appropriate money to the National Science Foundation, and maybe half of it's going for a Defense Department research, so it's not in their budget. That's a slick thing. By the way, it's signed by Captain, uh, Captain Olson, Acting Chief Central Planning Staff of the Central Intelligence Group. Now, I want to include also, before I forget, the CIA is involved not just here. Operation Mockingbird created in the 1950s, where they, they basically bribed and paid uh, publishers, editors of newspapers, TV stations, magazines to publish articles that they wanted. But later, if you read the church committee, uh, it was 38, 39 years ago, uh, they had a budget of three and a half billion dollars they were really busy bribing everybody they could to only publish what they wanted. Next one, Al Jazeera obtained broadcast license in the US. Uh, dear sweet Al Gore, who I love to call Igor, uh, he wanted to sell his network, which wasn't doing too good. Glenn Beck wanted to buy it, but God forbid, he was an American and also uh, loyal and a conservative. So instead, he sells it to Al Jazeera the, the, the organization that loves Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and fill in the blanks. <laughs> that was perfectly okay. So they went to the FCC, Federal Communications Commission, to get permission to go broadcast. <laughs> what happens? <laughs> they say go to the CIA in order to get vetted to go publish to broadcast in the United States. Got that? Remember the law? They can't do anything domestic? What the hell are they vetting anybody to broadcast anything in the United States? Reported by NBC News, January 20th, 2006. I'm going to repeat these two things because you deserve to know it. Next, how does the CIA prevent people from discovering the truth about the Ice Ages? I showed these two earlier. I'm going to repeat it again so it burns into your neurons. We'll know our disinformation program is complete when everything the American pu public believes is false. William Casey, director of the CIA, uh, from Ken Kuzman's letter, an impending disaster that takes place every 12 to 15,000 years. 
And now those pull reversals don't happen every 300 or 600,000 years. They know it's about 12,000 years. He said, many scientists are, are aware of this and that the covert reason for the space program was to explore the effects of the disaster throughout the solar system. You saw when they created NASA, he's telling the truth. He also said, we do not have the technology nor the foreseeable technology to avoid this inevitable situation. All we can hope to do is gather information. That's a fatalistic point of view, and I can understand why they had it in 1958, 59, but they shouldn't now. You can survive this thing. The way they control what you read in journals and what scientists do research for is, remember, they apply to the National Science Foundation for their missing two months, uh, and uh, that's how they control it. He who pays the piper plays the tune. So if you present a paper, say, hey, I think the sun nova isn't I'm going to prove it, you're not going to get any grant money. They'll simply say, well, this is outside the scope of what uh, uh, the average scientist believes in, and therefore we're not giving you the money. But, and I'm sure many scientists have, have gotten answers like that. Now, I also know this firsthand because the, when you read all the science journals I have, you can see where a scientist re, um, is writing between the lines. He's saying a nova without saying it. I'll continue. I want to go through a number of points that I know they've either obscured or changed the definition of or the, the cause of. Now, was I trying to find another explanation for the phenomena? The first one, which is what led me on to the six blank periods of space, is Bach globulars. And these little gray spots or dark areas are basically a big dust cloud around a star. And it was triangulated, and they figured it was between about 11,400 to about 13,000-something light years away from the Earth. These are all stars, probably like our own sun, that had Novid and the dust shell expanded. And you can't see them for about 1,000 years, and that's what happens. Uh, Bach had found 400 of, 450 of these all around our solar system, both closer to the center of the galaxy as well as farther away from the center of the galaxy, which makes no sense. So it makes no sense to have, the explanation they eventually gave these things was planetary nebula. Now, I think the next one shows, well, you'll see in a few minutes uh, what a planetary nebula is, a big dust shell around a star. And what the cover story or the substitute explanation, to be polite, uh, was that this is the beginning of a star and the interstellar dust collapses down by mutual gravity, and never explained how, and all of a sudden magically it becomes a star that produces a tremendous amount of energy and heats the place up. Uh, the problem is, is this. When they first discovered quasars, they've mapped over, I've seen two numbers, either 100,000 quasars or I've seen a number of 200,000 quasars. But most of them that they see, are close enough to see, uh, delineate, this is one that's, I think, it's 2.4 million light years away. You see this? This isn't dust or gas. That's stars, otherwise you'd never see it. And they shoot out from two different directions. This is a NASA um, drawing of what they think one of these quasars is. I don't know where they got the idea of the, of the toroid around here, but from a finite point that's only 0.3 to a 0.8 light years across, you have millions to billions of stars pouring out of this thing. Now also, it rotates and twists. That's where you get this twisting action in a spiral galaxy. So in other words, the stars on the outside here are older than the ones just coming out of this portal. That's real logical. Can't fight that logic. So it makes no sense to have a brand new star in the vicinity of a bunch of old stars like ours. Ours must be at least seven or eight billion years old. We're about 300,000 
um, sorry, 30,000 light years from the center of our galaxy, but it's not like a straight line. It's a big curve. So you measure that whole distance, you get an idea. My God, we're pretty old. Anyway, that's really what's going on. So they got a problem. Here we know stars are being coming from the middle of a quasar. Once they call them white holes. That actually made more sense. You have a tremendous amount of mass coming from a point in time in space that's very small out of nothing. And it's going out in two different directions, 180 degrees from each other. That's how stars are born. Not that crap that they teach you. But the reason they say that is because they're trying to get you away from the idea that these stars nova. <clears throat> Number three in the hit parade. The construction of our sun. The idea is one big mass inside, there's a bunch of atomic bombs going on, hydrogen bombs going off in here, and it gets to the surface. This is the chromosphere, the photosphere, and, and supposedly this is where you, what we see here. The holes are due to energy that comes through, and magnetic streams make these holes in the chromosphere. Uh, no. By the theory of multidimensional reality, it's a center modulation point, just like the center of the Earth. And you know, this is a big plasma. A lot of information being directed to a point in time and space. And out here is where this energy, or this information slash energy, um, goes down enough that it can start creating matter. First it's information, and then creates matter. That's what it is. So, a lot of scientists know that this thing isn't, can't be made the way it is. Here's some of the, and some of these things I'm going to, I put down the journal, the volume, the name of the journal, the volume, the date, and the page number. Go search it yourself. I could have made this list about five times longer, but what's the point? It's, I run out of room. <clears throat> also, the sun has about 20 different oscillations we know of. Here's some of them that are mentioned here. These two here basically said, basically, there's no way this sun could be powered by nuclear fusion and have these frequencies going on. Just no way. There's no, no provision in nuclear physics to allow that. But we know it's there. You can see it for yourself. In a second, you're going to see what it looks like when it's called helioseismology. And it pulsates. From this to that to that, and it goes back to this. It oscillates backwards and forwards. Here's other drawings of the same process that other scientists have made. Does this look like a bunch of hydrogen bombs going off? No. Something's in the center of this star that shares the same frequencies as the center of the Earth, like I explained much, much earlier in one of my other videos. I think it was a video series one. So, it's not powered what they say. The reason why they want to give you this nonsense, they don't want you to look at the sun as the source, the missing heat that creates the ice age. And you saw how easy it was to prove it. Here's examples of stars that have nova. This is V838, let's see if I can pronounce it, Monocerotis. It's about 24,000 light years away. Um, it was 24,000 something light years. And the, the light finally reached us at 2002, I believe. And we have a whole series of when the thing was just a star and then started to blow up. And the stupid explanation they gave, I have the paper by a Polish uh, astrophysicist. He said this was a light echo. Like nonsense, it's a light echo. We have the whole series of as this thing, this dust shell expanded. But you'll also notice there's the star. It didn't become a neutron star, a black hole, or anything else like that. It's still there. The same thing is true for all these other, they, they call these planetary nebulas, supposedly a new star in our vicinity. This is all within 12,000 light years of us. There's the star. It didn't blow up. It didn't become a neutron star. It's still there. This is the dust that it blew out after it noved. Here's more examples of it. There's the center of the star, and this is what it looks like. 
By the way, they all looked a little different. It's like people are all different. The stars are all a little different. They all blow differently. Okay, there's about five different explanations for what causes the Ice Age. I'm going to go through them fast. I have some of the references here. There's a lot more in the book. Um, I have like 26 pages of endnotes. And just in chapter 8, which, which is where this stuff is, uh, I think I have over 400 references from the journals. Anyway, astronomical theory of glaciation. The Earth received less energy output from the sun, causing a variety of re for a variety of reasons. And I got some of the reasons in here. But basically, it's either we went through a period of interstellar dust that we received less light from the sun, and some other crazy, weird explanations, all trying to figure out why they knew this, this thing happened cyclically through time, roughly 12,000 years. Second, continental drift causing land masses to move to colder latitudes. We know about continents drifting, but it's like uh, one or two inches per year it spreads out from the, uh, from the uh, mid-Atlantic ridge. But that's not going to explain these things at every 12,000 so years. There's just no way. The, the continents don't move that fast. Three, the Earth's rotation, tilt, and poles change, placing the north and south poles in different locations. What they're saying is that the, the Earth itself started moving like this, and so let's say New York City wound up to be the North Pole, or Washington State, or Vladivostok, you know. Um, uh, again, it doesn't explain a lot of the phenomena, including the mass extinction of species, the creation of new species, which I'll go to later. Uh, four, the change of the ocean's current. Um, there's a citation, two of them. Remember the movie, The uh, Day After Tomorrow, where supposedly some cold, you know, cold air from the Arctic came down and made an ice age. And it was taking place in New York. Uh, the only problem they have is, is that the last ice age New York City supposedly had an ice field of at least four or 5,000 feet thick. That wasn't what they showed in the movie. Uh, and last, this is the, the one that you've all been brainwashed to think. How CO2 increases and a greenhouse effect causes the ice age because CO2 found in gas bubbles in glacial ice. This is uh, William Bowker from Lamont Doherty, uh, um, Columbia University, known for basically one thing, to graduate left-wing Marxists and communists, especially in the journalism department. I read his article several times, I have it. No place in that whole article does he mention the word sun as a cause of anything. Uh, several years after he wrote this paper in 1985, scientists came up and said, there's over a thousand journal articles that show the Sun, Earth, weather connection, which anybody with an IQ over 80 would have already known. He wrote a political document, and there's a reason why it has to do with the Rockefeller Foundation, which heavily funds Columbia University and their journalism department. And, and they're the ones who came up with CO2. The reason why the CO2 is in the gas bubbles is very simple. If the sun novas uh, and hits one side of the Earth, last time it was, I believe, the, uh, if you do the longitude of China and India, that's where it hit. So any organic material facing the sun when it novaed, remember, the Earth stops its rotation, and it gets a good blast of heat as well as cosmic and, and gamma rays and, and uh, ultraviolet light. It's going to burn. So what's the byproduct of organic material burning? carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. That's why the gas bubbles in the glaciers have a higher amount of CO2 in them. Again, this is all to deceive you, to get you away from the fact our sun novas repeatedly. By the way, once you know it happens repeatedly, you can take nuclear physics and throw in the garbage because it means the universe is the product of information. And the nuclear physics we have today is anything but that. 
as I explained in video series one. Okay, the next one, explanation of what's in the center of the, of the Earth. I went through this in, in video series one on dimensions five through eight. <clears throat> it isn't a solid iron core. If it was, uh, in the center of this thing, iron loses its magnetic ability after the Curie temperature of either 975 or 1050, depending on the iron. And it takes time for the increased spike. It, it was a, it's a center modulation point, which is in here, just like the sun. But it takes about 240 to 280 days for a spike of energy here to translate through the outer core of the mantle. And finally, the crust will start moving. And you'll get it to see of earthquakes as well as increase in volcanoes. So that explanation, they keep, they give you an alternate explanation for every, almost everything. They don't want you to get to, the, to, to look at, one, the universe is the product of information, two, our sun novas. The next, the Earth's magnetic field itself. Now you've seen, and I've seen articles in YouTube and other places that that NASA and others know, it looks like the Earth's magnetic field is about to reverse. One of the models that's somewhat accepted, I think was developed by Professor Boosie from UCLA. I actually spoke to him when I lived in, UC, lived in uh, West LA. And his idea was that you had convection currents of iron going in the outer core like this into the mantle, and these set up an electrical field the only problem with that is when you have multiples, which you'd have to have multiple convection currents, the magnetic fields, if they cross each other, they cancel each other out. What's causing this stuff, like I explained in video series one, is you have a center modulation point that propagates various frequencies, and we know that from the DE, F1, and F2 uh, um, layers in the ionosphere. So when it reverses, it does it in one day. But it, it doesn't have to go to zero. It goes, I think, to maybe about 15,000 gammas, and then it can reverse itself. And that's explained in the book. The book has a much, much larger and longer explanation. I've, been, I've changed a few thoughts over the last 11 years since I, I wrote God's Day Judgment book. But anyway, seafloor spreading. This is a fact. They started taking magnetometers and dragging along a ship from the Mid-Atlantic Ridge where lava comes up and where the European continent and the African continent separates from North and South America. It spreads out. In some places it's one inch per year, some places it's two inches per year. But we know from the readings that it's very even and it's not every three or 400 or 600,000 years. It's not that. And they know it. But they just leave it. It's a fact that just is left and they did hundreds of these measurements, by the way. The Navy did hundreds of them. So anyway, they know the polar reversals happen equally through time. Next, mass extinction of species and the creation of new ones. It's easy to explain the mass extinction of species. These are the major epos or blocks of time that we measure in, in geology. And each one of these is marked by a major polar reversal, a geomagnetic reversal. You have an extinction and a creation of new species based on the old one. Now, that's the part they cannot explain. What a star, there's only three things that alter the DNA uh, in, our, in our genes. Cosmic rays, gamma rays, and ultraviolet light. Some of these journal lockers I have here go into that stuff. You can copy them. I have many, many more in the book. I could have had like five times more. It's, it's a well-known fact that those are the things that alter the DNA in, in genes. When a star novas, it gives off all three, cosmic rays, gamma rays, and ultraviolet light, and it affects everything. So in other words, you have one species, and if its egg survived, its DNA gets modified by the cosmic rays given off when the sun novas, and a new species is born. Also, what's interesting about this, I'm going to mention it now. You'll notice in the past, we know that the Earth was closer to the sun 
it was warmer, and we had a lot more water, which evaporates, a little bit evaporates every time there's a nova. But you notice the reptiles are all three-chambered hearts. They don't produce their own heat. They didn't have to because it was so much warmer. As the Earth got pushed further and further away from the sun, it got colder and colder. Here we are in the Pleistocene. The Pleistocene and Holocene is this current period. This Pleistocene period, which they estimate is about 1.8 million years ago, some say about 2 million, 2.5 million years ago, is marked by repeated glaciations. Repeated ice ages. It's because we're further away from the sun. You're going to see it shortly regarding the ocean levels over time. But alternate explanation was given for much of this stuff. The time periods are really guesswork. We really don't know. You try to do it by aluminum-26 and other isotopes, but it's, it's somewhat guesswork. This is what I talk about the ocean levels and um, geomagnetic reversals. This was in one of my, one of my geology books. Uh, actually, it was in the uh, uh, GSA Today, and it was wonderful. This is Triassic period, and this is an abrupt drop in the ocean level, 663 feet. You'll notice as we get closer to our time, this becomes less and less because every time there's a nova, we lose a little bit of water and we're pushed a little further away from the sun. So each one of these events lines up with a reversal. Uh, black and white are alternate reversals. When you have this, it means they got so many, they can't, don't quite know how to delineate one from another. But you'll see as we go through time, Jurassic period early and then middle, six, 623, 583, on the average of where it's, it's going down. And up to here. Then we get to late Jurassic period and then Cretaceous, 468 feet down as the average. So, and here's the magnetic fields. Here, highly variable polarity. They had so many there. They're all short-term stuff. <laughs> that All they could say is that. Otherwise, you got a bunch of thin lines here. But that's, they all correlate with an immediate drop in ocean water. They don't explain how this could happen, but now you know. When the sun novas, probably the sun side of the Earth, probably that ocean gets evaporated maybe 1,000, maybe 1,200 feet. After that passes, then the oceans kind of balance themselves out. We know about 400 feet. It was certainly for 50 or 100, feet, 100 years later, and then 350 for a while. Next explanation, the formation of comets. Big, dirty snowballs with radically elliptical orbits. This is supposed to be the sun. Uh, this is the Earth's orbit here. So, how do we get, the, the real question with a comet is, how come it's got this radical, radical elliptical orbit going that way? You know, some force did something that forced a bunch of water and dust and rock to go that away, away from the sun. Well, now you know what it is. You saw it with the ocean levels. Some of these comets are from our oceans that had been evaporated and shot out to space. <laughs> but they eventually lose momentum and, and the gravity of the sun brings it back. <laughs> this one here is a path of a number of different uh, comets. <laughs> What's funny is the way they did this is that they made it all intersect the Earth's orbit, the third planet from the, from in the solar system. And some of these are probably from our own sun, but some uh, in the past were from Mars also. I mean, we know they had oceans and stuff like that, and you'll see that shortly. Uh, oh, they'll be, they'll, the, the video after this is going to be on the proof that the sun does nova, the physical evidence it leaves behind. You'll enjoy that. Okay. This phenomena, they've never been able to explain. I'll explain why. These are the deep sea canyons. They show up all over the world. 
on every continental shelf, you'll have this kind of a pattern. Some of these canyons are a lot bigger than the Grand Canyon, and they go a lot longer, too. And they can't explain it. I'm going to. Uh, there'll be, I think, video series in, in this, uh, video series four, the third will be on the oceans. Anyway, um, chemistry 1A, or, or 101. Fresh water is lighter than salt water because the minerals in salt water. So when a river flows into the ocean, it leaves a, an alluvial plain like the Nile Delta, the Mississippi Delta, uh, the Amazon has one, uh, Bangladesh is basically the, the, the outflow of the Ganges River. Uh, uh, it, it basically deposits silt. Okay. They, they knew something was up with this. Now, I know the Air Force knows uh, in 1978 that um, the Earth's magnetic field controls the rotation of the Earth. And I'll go into that uh, in, I think, the series on or the ocean, because it fits then. Anyway, so how are all these canyons, really big ones, they go all the way down to the bottom of the ocean, by the way. How could they possibly form unless there was no salt water there, right? It has to be empty. Here's another one, how they map the, this is Oceanographer Canyon. I'll, I'll tell you what's so special about this one. <clears throat> the, the Navy built the Alvin in the early 60s. They must have caught on to what's going on. And they dove down into this sucker and what they saw was um, evidence of a massive amount of water. They saw tree limbs. They saw huge rocks and boulders that were cascaded down these side slopes, down this thing. But they saw no current whatsoever today coming down here. So what, what was the force that pushed all these trees and other things down into these big, huge submarine canyons? I'll give you a clue. Remember I told you that the Air Force, by a RAND Corporation paper, which I have, and you'll see it when I do that video, they know, they want to figure out how come the Earth's rotation was slowing down. The end of the article basically says that uh, the dipole, or the magnetic field of the Earth, decays, and that's the thing that's causing the Earth to slow down. Well, imagine when the Earth's magnetic field reverses. The Earth stops its rotation. So imagine, simple test. Take a pan of water, fill it, try to increase your speed to about three miles an hour, stop short. Find out what happens. Now you know what happened here. So if you're sitting on the Atlantic side, which would be now, uh, and it was two cycles ago that was like that, you'd see the Atlantic Ocean rushing away from you real fast all the way down to the bottom of the ocean. But on the other side, the Pacific's coming towards you real fast, too. But I'll go into that when I cover the ocean. <clears throat> Here's on the west coast, Monterey, California. Here's the Monterey Canyon. As it meanders all the way down to the bottom of the Pacific. But you'll notice all along here is the same kind of gullies and patterns. Not as big as that, but here's a pretty big one here. So what's causing all of this? You, can, you can't have this unless there was no ocean water there. There was one in one of my journal articles from GSA, uh, Geological Society of America, which I'm a proud member of. Uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, somebody did a side scan radar of the Gulf of Mexico and they found a meandering river all the way down to the Pacific from the uh, Colorado River all the way through there and it's all covered by the ocean, but at one time there was no ocean there in the, in, in the Gulf of Mexico. Gulf of Baja, rather. Anyway, this is this blow up here. This is wider than the Grand Canyon, goes deeper too. And this is only measuring up to about there. That's all. Goes way down. Next one, why is the sea surface temperature increasing? 
again, global warming, your hibachi and your SUV is causing it, and, and coal burning is definitely causing it. Here's our Gleisberg cycle. And one sunspot maximum after that would bring it up to here. But after that, it went steady. Now, this is measured on Fahrenheit, so it's saying it's gone up to about one and a half degrees warmer over this period of time. Now, I've seen during sunspot maximums all off the coast of uh, Indonesia going up as much as four and five degrees during a sunspot maximum. It's delay it lags about a year to two years. It takes longer for water to heat up. So it gets its maximum about a year or two years after sunspot maximum. But it's the sun. This would be happening if nobody was on the planet. Next phenomena, just left out there and nobody could figure this sucker out. Of course I did. Um, these are mammoths. This guy's fast thrown. This is a real photo of one. Not an artist's rendering. And some of it melted, and he's actually bleeding, but he's dead. Uh, and they found him. This is in, in Siberia to Russia, all along here. Now, notice the rivers all flow north. I think really where their grazing area was, was in this area, probably. So how do they get up here? The same thing goes up in Alaska here, too. In fact, I saw a mastodon teeth when I went gold mining in, uh, in the Klondike, so uh, in the tailings. Uh, anyway, uh, it, these guys were fast frozen, and with daisy cups still in their mouth, their, their flesh was still good that during the 18th and 19th century, uh, much of the ivory in Europe came from here, from Russia, from mastodons and mammoths. So, uh, the question is, uh, they were able to feed their sled dogs the, the flesh from these frozen animals. So how do they get fast frozen? The answer is what's happening 180 degrees on the other side of the Earth. That's the side that the dust shell hit 17 to 18 hours after the Nova. It, it reaches the Earth at a speed of about 1,550 miles per second pretty fast. And uh, I'll give you a hint what causes this. Boyle's Law. I'll explain it in greater de detail later in another video in this series. Okay, how the CIA prevented people from discovering the truth about the Ice Ages? Well, you found out some of it. They gave you alternate explanations of the phenomena that were See Now, I wrote it down. I don't normally read stuff, but I had to think about this thing three or four times, how I was going to explain this. And this message is really for, to those in the CIA and their leadership. First of all, I want to state the, the reason I'm doing these videos is so some people will survive this polar reversal and ice age. Obviously, Somebody did, otherwise we wouldn't be talking and living right now. And people survived all over the world. In my book, Reality, Reality Revealed, some 41 years ago, uh, I go through the structures and mythologies from all over the world. People did survive it. But I don't think the leadership in the CIA really thinks anyone's going to make it. I really do. Let's recap what the CIA has done. Your leadership in 1958 decided... Uh, to influence and increase the research on the sun and moon and, and get some answers from the research. That's why the space program and NASA, etc. After the samples came back from the moon in the late 60s and early 70s, you knew the sun did nova, and that was the missing heat that created the ice age and all ice ages. However, you didn't know the mechanism. I figured that out in 1977, and that's why your agent contacted me, I think, 1979, 1980, I think is when he called me up, and when uh, Fort Lewis had called me up. Sometime in the early 70s, your leadership must have game-planned the real possibility our sun will nova again. 
You may have connected the pole reversal as the cause, but I see no proof for that yet. It is also obviously that your previous leadership had a fatalistic viewpoint and thought that no one would, could survive it. They're wrong. So it was important to cover up any research that would lead to the correct conclusion. Hence, National Science Foundation, and you made sure any scientist who was going to come to the, the right conclusion didn't get the funding. What you did was develop an alternate explanation for all the phenomena I listed below. Or you dropped the phenomena you never mentioned, like bacillobules and a bunch of others. You just don't say anything. You must have been thrilled when Stephen Hawking came up with an alternate explanation for all the energy emitted from quasars. The reason I say that is <clears throat> the amount of energy coming from a quasar was like 10 to the 54 ergs. In other words, if it kept an output like that, it would have used up all the lighter elements. There wouldn't be any hydrogen, helium, oxygen, stuff like that. It wouldn't be any of that stuff because all, it would have been all been used up as energy for this quote-unquote nuclear fuel, which is obviously totally wrong. You have directed and, and, and restricted the scientific research for the past 60 years to cover up the real causes of the Ice Age. You did that through the NSF, National Science Foundation, science journals you control directly and indirectly. I am sure your current leadership is asking for advice on climate change from professors that have been brainwashed for the last 60 years on, on the subjects you want them to, to believe in. By definition, they, they cannot give you the right answer because they were never taught the whole truth. Maybe you think like your predecessor in Ken, Davidson's, Ken uh, Kuzman's uh, cousin that there's nothing you can do, nobody's gonna make the thing, so if it happens, so what? I'm sure you're trying to save yourselves though, that I'm sure of. In conclusion, how stupid can you be? Do you actually think you can keep this event a secret and no one's going to suspect something's gonna happen? People survived the last cataclysm, like I mentioned, all over the world. I don't know exactly how they did it, but they certainly did do it. <clears throat> you can survive this man, and I'm sure your leadership doesn't have a clue what to do to save themselves. Well, the moon will tell everybody something terrible is going to happen, and you cannot hide that. You only have less than 28 years before the next Gleisberg cycle between September and December 2046. This is a solar eclipse of 2015, and the sun was already a little bit bigger than the moon. Remember, we were all taught the moon's supposed to cover the, the photosphere and that perfectly, and you see the corona. This is the one from the last one, February 26, 2017. Here's the moon, really heavy filter. Here's the sun. Eventually, this thing's going to be a white sidewall tire. I mean, how dumb you make the people, they're going to know something terrible is going to happen. Besides, they're going to be linked to the hotter weather, more hurricanes, more tornadoes. You're going to know something bad's going to happen. You can't keep it a secret. Die Hole Foundation is a 501c3, like I said, a science foundation. Take contributions to continue our research to hire basically geologists to do some more of the research and also what to do and what side of the earth is going to be facing the next nova. Because this thing's going to happen. Like I said in one of the videos on the 11th code system, uh, Moses' 10 code system, there was 11th that was God's. The Torah actually gives an exact month, the day, and the year for the next reversal. I'm not kidding. And it was dead center between September and December 2046. I can't make this stuff up. I'm not that creative. Anyway, thank you for listening. I know I went long on it, but the subject is so important, I'm sure you realize it.